Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, uh, morning session of the SFD um, dedicated to advanced method. So the first day speaker is um, Daniele Simeoni, who will talk about uh, relativistic lattice Boltzmann method for rarefied uh, gas dynamics. So please, Daniele. So uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for uh, giving me the chance to present uh, the results uh, that uh, we developed in our group in Ferrara. And today I'm going to talk, uh, it's going to be a methodological uh, talk, more or less, and I'm going to talk about an, um, uh, an extension of the three efficient relativistic lattice Boltzmann method that, that was developed uh, in Ferrara to just simulate uh, uh, fluids, relativistic fluids in the hydrodynamic regime. And I'm going to talk about how to extend this meter to work into beyond hydrodynamic regime. Uh, I'm going to break up my presentations into these uh, five points. I'm going to give you, for those of, no, of you who are, who are not familiar with relativistic hydrodynamics and uh, relativistic kinetic theory, I'm going to give you a side by side comparison with uh, with the usual classical hydrodynamics and um, and i'm going to give you all the details about no i mean some details about uh, the main ideas which are behind the relativistic lattice boltzmann method also then i'm going to tell you how we did extend this meter to work uh, uh, with beyond hydrodynamic regimes uh, I'm going to show you uh, the benchmark that we've used to verify our results, and and I will, I will uh, we will see that uh, the the previous iteration, which we call on lattice iteration of the the method, fails to um, uh, simulate fluids uh, at high Knudsen number, and I will show you how this new iteration is instead uh, working uh, well on our benchmark. Uh, so first, uh, before, uh, let me say why do we even bother in wanting to reproduce relativistic hydrodynamics beyond, uh, uh, I mean, relativistic flows beyond the hydrodynamic uh, limit or regime. Uh, well, actually, there are some, uh, um, a couple of reasons why we should bother uh, with that. It comes out that the um, quark gluon plasma, which is developed when uh, you have in, in, in particle colliders, when you have heavy ion uh, collisions. Uh, so this quark gluon plasma is an hydrodynamic phase. At some point of its evolution, uh, shows hydrodynamics uh, uh, behavior. But then uh, one would like to be able to, 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 to reproduce the dynamics beyond uh, this phase. So that's uh, one reason why it's it's important to develop schemes which are able to simulate relativistic flows beyond uh, this regime. Also, it comes out that the electron flows, which are mostly ballistic flows uh, in graphene, for example, or in exotic materials uh, are ballistic, of course, so, so that uh, it means that you have to be able to also simulate uh, beyond hydro regimes in this case. And the very same technique, some of you might remember from the talk I gave last year uh, at the SFD, um, uh, the very same techniques that we are using here in our relativistic lattice Boltzmann method can be used in lattice Boltzmann light methods for the simulation of radiation dynamics, so mainly astrophysical context. So now that we have the reasons why we are doing what we are doing, let me uh, jump to a side-by-side -side comparison of uh, relativistic kinetic theory or relativistic hydrodynamics with respect to the classical ones. You see the starting point is more or less the same. Of course, now you have to express everything with, uh, within the language of uh, special relativity so that you have a Boltzmann equation, of course, and you have still a relaxation time uh, approximation for the collision in the integral, but this time uh, the, this collision, uh, this, this approximation is called the Anderson Bitkin collisional model, and it's slightly modified. Uh, you do have a different Maxwell Jutner distribu um, equilibrium distribution, the Maxwell Jutner distribution, and the most important. Uh, uh, difference with respect to the to the classical case is that uh, the microscopic uh, velocity in the relativistic framework the, the 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 role of the microscopic velocity is, is 
replaced by the microscopic form momentum. And uh, so the dependency of the exponent of the distribution is linear with respect to the fact that in the Maxwell-Boltzmann uh, distribution, the dependency is quadratic, which means that you cannot go for the same techniques uh, for the quadratures uh, when you do discretize your velocity space. Uh, and and it, this makes a little bit more complicated the development of the method, but nevertheless, you can do that. Also, what you have is that uh, the macroscopic quantity this that you do recover as the first moment of your distribution function are the particle flow and the energy momentum tensor. And from here, you can get the usual thermodynamic quantities like pressure, velocity, uh, macroscopic velocity, and uh, temperature, and so on and so forth. The way you have to control how much relativistic the, 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 your fluid is, is this uh, parameter, which is called relativistic coldness, which is not, which is nothing more uh, than the ratio between the rest um, uh, mass of the particles with respect to the thermal energy. The way you have to think about this is that the higher the temperature, the quicker the particles are going. And uh, so that you need uh, a special relativity to describe the fluid, the, high, the, 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 the bigger the mass of the particles, the slower they are going, okay? So by controlling, by using this parameter, you can control how much relativistic you are, your fluid is, and then you can, therefore you can move from this picture to this picture uh, in a continuous way. So the relativistic Lattice-Boltzmann method is nothing more than taking the, 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 the usual Lattice-Boltzmann and uh, in the relative special in the framework of special relativity and adapt it to work in, into this framework. Uh, it's a, a scheme that's um, equipped to, to simulate fluids in one, two, and three spatial dimensions. So in any number of spatial dimensions, the most important thing is that this iteration, which I will be called uh, on lattice uh, uh, RLBM from now on, has a velocity stencil that are uh, that show perfect streaming, which means that the velocities are ending on the nodes of the Cartesian grid, like the usual lattice Boltzmann methods are. Um, but uh, it comes out that if you really want to simulate fluids at high units and number, what you have to do, of course, and this is uh, also a trivial uh, thought one might have, is that you have to discretize your velocity space in a finer way which means that you have to relax the perfect streaming condition so you don't have a need to have the velocities which are ending up on the node of the Cartesian grid anymore. Of course, you are going to pay with the use of interpolation here. But then if you do like this, then you can arrange your velocity stencil in a more isotropic way. And this is beneficial for the simulation of rarefied uh, gases and unlocks the use of more elaborated quadrature schemes. The ones that we are using right now, so what we have to do is to discretize the form momentum, the microscopic form momentum, which you know as is divided as a, a, with a, um, between a, a time component, uh, which is representing the energy of the particle, of course, and, uh, and the other space components. So for the time component or like the energy of the microscopic particles, we are using generalized Laguerre quadrature rules. And for the, 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 the space components, we are using some angular quadratures, which, are going to, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. In 2D, uh, what we adopt is some quadrature rules. Like, like in, in 2D, the work is quite easy. Uh, what you want to do is to integrate some uh, functions of an angle on, over the circle, and uh, and this you can do uh, by actually taking angles, which are uh, by subdividing your your, your circle into uh, different angles and uh, not different, like in 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 in, in the same uh, number of angles. And provided that you keep enough uh, angles, then you are going to recover exactly your integrals as discrete sums. The T uh, here, the, the, the different colors are representing the different energies for the microscopic particles, uh, the, the microscopic uh, momenta. And uh, the thing is that in 3D, 
the task is a little bit more complicated and uh, you have to go for uh, quadrature rules which are uh, integrating angular functions on the surface of a sphere. And this you can do using a different number of techniques, uh, namely the Kautelejan quadrature rule, which is itself a product rule. And then Lebedev quadrature rule and also the spherical design one. And you can see that you, that, you, oh, you, that you can obtain velocities which are distributed on the sphere in different ways. And uh, uh, typically you see that the Gauss-Lejeune quadrature rule is giving you velocities which are... Uh, we have that this train is placed under surveillance video. Uh, which are giving you velocities which are not distributing the, 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 the nodes uh, homogeneously on the sphere. And this is not something we want. So may, you may be wanting to use Lebedev or spherical design quadrature rules. Let me jump, uh, no, first, uh, another ingredient that we can use in order to increase uh, the, the isotropy of our uh, stencil is just basically to decouple the radial, the radial quadrature, so the quadrature that, that we're using for the energy uh, with respect to the angular quadrature. So that we are using for the space components of the four momenta. And uh, if you do decouple these quadratures, which means that for every energy you're using a different uh, angular quadrature, then you obtain stencil like the one depicted in the, on the right, and uh, which is uh, giving you a finer discretization of the, the, the velocity space. And this is definitely improving the quality of the, of, of, of the simulation in the case of arguments and number. Here on the left, you see an old uh, on lapis stencil. And uh, so a stencil that we were using with the previous iteration of the scheme. And, uh, and you see by like on your own that you do have like that the velocity space is way more covered in this uh, example on the right. Now let me jump to our problem, to our benchmark that we use to see if, if we are really obtaining some improvements. And uh, of course, we are using a, a benchmark that uh, more or less everybody knows here and uh, the, 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 the Riemann problem, uh, also called in the relativistic framework, the relativistic Sotschak tube. And uh, it, it consists basically in a tube uh, filled with a gas divided into chambers by a membrane both these two chambers are on different thermodynamic states. So you have different pressure, uh, density and temperature. Then at some point you remove the membrane and there is a shock and rarefaction wave uh, developing into the tube. And uh, the great thing about this benchmark is that we can control, we, we do have some uh, analytic solution or else we can, we can compare with other numerical schemes for a wide range of parameters. So our, phase, uh, our, our parameter phase, phase space is consisting of uh, the Knudsen number, of course, which is saying us how um, hydrodynamic we are or we are not. And then there is relativistic coldness parameter that I talked to you about before, which is giving you uh, an information on how much relativistic we are. And uh, by controlling these two parameters, we can explore the parameter phase space in quite a nice way and adding always uh, our benchmark solutions at, at end. And uh, you see that once we are in the hydrodynamic regime, uh, we are like everything is fine using the old on lapis scheme. So for different values, values of the relativistic coldness, so for uh, lighter particles and, 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 and heavier particles, we are able to reproduce the dynamic in quite a nice way. Here we are I'm depicting the velocity, the macroscopic velocity of the fluid and also the pressure. And you see that we recover the, the, the solutions in a nice way. But here, instead, when we move from the uh, hydrodynamic, re the indicate regime, which is depicted here by the blue line, toward the red line, which is representing here the free streaming regime, so I not in number, you see that the old iteration, the old lattice iteration of the scheme is, show is showing here these uh, stepwise artifacts 
uh, that are really, I mean, the scheme is still able to reproduce the general dynamic, the general uh, solution, but it's giving, like, it's giving you this artifact. And this, it turns out, it, you can cure it by, by employing this finer discretization of the velocity space plus the decoupling of the radial and uh, energy, uh, and the radial and angular uh, quadratures. And uh, lastly, one last thing I want to show you is another benchmark that we've employed is uh, it's just basically the same thing, but on a uh, bidimensional domain. So what we did was to take a bidimensional shock, so divide our 2D system in, into four chambers and remove these membranes, these two membranes at some point. These four chambers are on, four, on three different uh, thermodynamic states remove the chambers and then you see what happens to the to the shock waves uh, that are developing into the fluid and what i'm showing here is that uh, here on top we have the new iteration the off lattice iteration of the scheme of the relativistic scheme and um, on, on the bottom you have instead the old uh, on lattice iteration of the of the numerical scheme and you see that at low moons and numbers so when we are sitting on the isodynamic regime then the solutions uh, do coincide uh, so the, the results coincide but when when you go to eigenness and number the solution given by uh, the off lattice scheme is more regular while the the, the the solution provided by the on lattice scheme is showing some artifacts and some, some, some problems, clearly. I mean, of course, we don't have an analytic solution to compare to, but uh, it's reasonable to think that uh, the on lattice uh, scheme is not really uh, working well. And of course, this is just, uh, this is not quantitative, but it's, this is a qualitative uh, uh, thing that we have to take in consideration. And now I will just close, uh, just giving you the, the, the basic parts of this presentation, this methodological presentation. Uh, so the relativistic lattice Boltzmann meters are an application of the lattice Boltzmann machinery to special relativity. Since they are based on, on a mesoscopic description of the flows, and um, it, in principle, they should be able to just uh, reproduce the dynamic at, uh, beyond hydrodynamic regime. And in fact, this is what they do if you, um, if you perform finer discretizations of velocity space and use the, the couple uh, quadrature rules. I'm finished. Uh, I just want to say that if you want to find some more details about the, 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 the numerical scheme, uh, the general numerical scheme, and it's on lattice iteration, you can go and have a look at this physics report that we published uh, last year. And uh, if you instead want to uh, add some details on the, this new off lattice iteration, then you can go to Journal of Computational Science um, and, and in this paper where we are explaining how the 2D uh, version of the scheme works and or else we are preparing uh, another paper to, to explain how massive uh, 3D, the, the massive 3D version of the scheme works. And that's it. I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Daniele, for a nice presentation. So um, I think that there is a question. So if you can reply quickly, since we are already uh, yeah. out of time, uh, that's fine. Otherwise, we can. Uh, uh, let me. Okay. How to uh, so basically there are two okay, questions okay, i would yeah. say you can reply the first one and and then uh, the second one we can discuss i will it. I, I will, I will uh, reply to the question by luis Egele. Uh, have you tried using high order regularization for your own lattice scheme for the benchmark problem uh, no not really not really what we did was actually to just move uh, it was a just a trial and error we 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 went uh, to the, we were using the all lattice scheme. And then uh, what we did was, but why cannot we go off lattice? And, uh, and that's uh, a trial we did. And 
it worked. So we didn't try the, to, to regularize the on Lattice uh, version. Okay, so I'm, I'm sorry, we need to stop here, otherwise- I will, uh, I will just reply on the- on Yeah, the you, can, you can write in the chat, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, Daniel, for a nice presentation. Uh, so we can move to the next speaker, um, who is Johan Bocanegra, I think. Uh, yes, uh, Augusto Bocanegra. Uh, <laughs> I have two names, but uh, Augusto Bocanegra. Okay, so I think you can share the screen. Sorry, Daniele. So I was just, uh, I was just saying, do, do, do I have to stop this sharing or? Yeah, you can, you can stop the sharing. I think, I think, um, what can okay, I get? So it's already stopped. Okay, okay, fine. Bye. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, just a very quick introduction. So Dr. Bocanega will speak about Lattice Boltzmann applications to acoustics. So uh, please. Yes, um, good morning. Okay, um, the content of, the, of this talk is um, a very quick uh, revision of the Lattice Boltzmann method. And um, we perform a literature review around the application of, of the Lattice Boltzmann in, in acoustics. And uh, finally, some remarks regarding this, uh, this topic. Um, along the presentation, uh, you can see also some simulations that we perform, uh, trying to reproduce uh, some of the results found in the literature. Um, this part around the lattice Boltzmann method uh, will be very quick. We know that the physical bases are related with the probability density function, the statistical distribution, and the Boltzmann equation that um, represents an equilibrium between the transport and the collision of this quantity. Um, the um, uh, expansion for the equilibrium is normally truncated. Uh, for the, for the lattice Boltzmann method, but um, some attempts to go to high order uh, expansions uh, are of interest in, in acoustics. Also, the um, uh, velocity discretization um, using float number, uh, the molecular noise that uh, was obtained by lattice gas automata um, was improved. But um, for acoustics, um, some authors try to, to make uh, multi space, multi speed um, discretizations. You see here uh, high order lattices. Okay, and um, I go directly for uh, to the literature review. We found around 120 items. And we try to, um, first of all, try to know what problems in the acoustical field uh, are treated with uh, lattice Boltzmann method. Who is adapted? How is adapted the lattice Boltzmann method to, to the acoustical problems? How are validated the results? Uh, and try to figure what is the trend in in the research in acoustics uh, using the lattice Boltzmann method. Uh, we classify the works that we found in, in these seven groups, uh, early works in, with lattice gas automata, um, wave theory, generation of sound, propagation of sound, and some uh, wave uh, phenomena, boundary conditions, porous materials and sound absorption, aeroacoustics, outdoor acoustics, and musical acoustics. Um, we, in this talk, uh, I go directly to the second point and uh, I show only a few around aeroacoustics because it's a very hot topic and we pretend to go and, and do a, a, a specific preview around aeroacoustics. Um, here uh, we can see the, a timeline by decade um, with the uh, found literature. You can see the increasing interest 
in the, in the last decade in all the topics. Okay, we go directly to uh, wave theory. Um, here are listed uh, some of the uh, some of the works with the author, the type of grid, the collision model, uh, turbulence, or some other special feature in the model, the acoustic uh, problem, the type of validation, and some hints or remarks. Uh, I want to say that um, before 2000, Buick uh, start to, to make simulations around nonlinear acoustics, propagation of nonlinear uh, waves. Um, some other interesting work uh, is this one of Laleman and Luo that use multi speed approach um, to increment uh, stability. Um, then, um, we can Cosgrove uh, try to introduce variable zone speed uh, using a uh, body force term. Marie et al. Uh, study uh, and compare uh, the single relax relaxation time and the multiple relaxation time schemes for a Gaussian pool propagation. And this work is, is uh, very important, the work of Beacon. Uh, who uh, research around the uh, punctual zone sources. Um, Li and Chan develop a multi-speed approach to adiabatic waves because we know that the simple BGK scheme is, scheme is isothermal, then mm, some attempts to, to simulate adiabatic waves uh, were attempt by different uh, researchers and Lian Chan will make the, this work. Um, Beacon um, make uh, also an approximation to multiple sources. Some other works uh, are related with thermoacoustic waves and um, are very interesting. Um, I, I chose some extracts. This is before 2000. Um, here we, we see nonlinear waves and linear waves propagation. This is around the this work performs the propagation of a Gaussian pulse and uh, try to study uh, uh, study the, the dissipation of the pulse. Um, some something similar with a plane wave is simulated here in this work of Bress, Perot, and Fred. Um, and one of the, that uh, I highlight is the work of Beacon with the punctual source. Uh, here we show some results uh, that we obtained trying to simulate and reproduce the work. Um, we see the BGK uh, scheme give a lot of noise with a low viscosity value. But the multiple relaxation time uh, performs very well. Um, also, the regularized scheme, um, we test also the, the entropic lattice volume method, but it uh, gives um, noise. Here we are in uh, with a low in, in a low viscosity range. Um, this simulation um, is only to illustrate. Um, something that uh, is is known by uh, who worked with uh, waves, the interferences, um, the maximums and minimums by the interference of two uh, sources are very, very well represented by this simulation. The simulation was performed with a multi-relaxation time um, okay, we also can simulate Gaussian pulses, diffraction, and interference. Um, here um, in the left side, one um, small obstacle, and in the right side, uh, diffraction through a hole. You can see that uh, the tiny obstacle is virtually transparent to the, to the propagation of, of the wave. And uh, in the right side, um, 
as was expected uh, analytically. Um, the plane wave is uh, diffracted by the hole and act as a point source. And um, here in the left side, we can see some reflections in the boundary. And this uh, open uh, to the next uh, topic that is the boundary conditions and the attempts to obtain non-reflective boundary condition. Uh, we have different types of non-reflecting boundary conditions. The zero gradient um, fixing the normal gradient uh, of the population equal to zero works very well for flow, but reflects acoustic waves. Then um, some uh, strategies have the absorbing boundary condition uh, and the perfect match layer implies the use of a buffer zone that uh, absorbs by an increasing viscosity uh, the, the wave. And uh, without the use of a buffer zone, you can use the characteristic boundary conditions uh, to, to uh, perform this, this kind of, um, of condition that is a need in, in acoustics. Um, here, uh, only to to show uh, you um, the use of a buffer zone in the top implemented. In this moment, the wave is entering uh, to the buffer zone. And we can see that uh, in the top side, the wave is dissipating. But of course, this increase the computational um, consumption, and the computational uh, resources that you imply in your simulation because you need to uh, use a more large um, uh, grid to include the buff this buffer zone. Uh, here um, is the list of some of the work that we found uh, around uh, non-reflective boundary condition. Um, in recent years, the perfect match layer was of very interest uh, for the researchers. Also, they developed impedance boundary conditions. Okay, I go for porous material and sound absorption. Some uh, works uh, are uh, related with porous materials, simulated directly and um, using the Darcy law uh, to um, obtain the flow resistivity um, or measuring the sun absorption directly. We see perforated plates, uh, porous material, woven or non-woven materials. And um, here I show you two strategies that can be implemented. The direct uh, a strategy, mm, we, you can uh, propagate a pulse and implement the bounce back boundary condition to simulate mm, the porous material with a, a periodic boundary condition as was performed by Da Silva and colleagues. Mm, this or this work this is a perforated plate and propagate noise uh, and compare the pressure upstream and downstream and uh, obtain the absorption coefficient of the perforated plate. The indirect strategy is to use flow simulations with the lattice boundary method um, to obtain the, the flow resistivity and use some uh, semi empirical model for absorption as the Delaney Basley model that um, only need this non-acoustical parameter called the, uh, the flow resistivity to obtain the, the absorption curve. As I say at the beginning, the aeroacoustic is a very hot topic. There are a lot, very, a lot of, of, of work. Uh, I show only some of them. Mm, this is very, very interesting. Okay. Direct noise mm, computation with lattice Bowman method and application to industrial test cases. 
uh, here it was applied to landing gear, uh, jet noise. This is a, a very now a very standard benchmark uh, of a flow around the cylinder. You know that some vorticities are generated, and of course, some uh, noise can be uh, simulated by, by this process. Uh, also, the jet noise. Uh, these, these two slides um, are results of our simulations. In outdoor acoustics, there are only few works that, that we found, uh, some around tsunami, uh, volcano, shock waves in volcano, waves from a tsunami, acoustic underwater uh, for warfare uh, scenarios. But for our interest in engineering, this work of Solomon is, is very interesting. That uh, correct, um, the prediction of the lattice Bowman method by making the difference with the free field solution. Um, I show here the um, some source in, in the free field with dissipation that is normally obtained by lattice Bowman. Um, and without dissipation, we see that the, the viscosity generates uh, a lot of, uh, of dissipation. But if we performed the difference between the sound level and the free field level, uh, it's possible to correct, to have a correction ar ar around uh, the prediction of the lattice Boltzmann. And it seems that could be a, a way to perform uh, outdoor acoustic simulations. They perform a porous ground, some simulation with porous ground with a um, sound barrier. And also uh, the effect of wind in, in the acoustic propagation. We perform some similar, similar simulations. And finally, the musical acoustics uh, that are of interest for our group mainly by the applications in corrugated tubes. But um, some works are related also with uh, flute, flute uh, and whistles and some other musical instruments. Um, the, one, the first work that we can see in this way is uh, the Scortos work. He is known by the boundary condition proposed in this work, but uh, the work is related with uh, organ, flute, recording, recorder, uh, and some other flute-like instruments. Kunelt, Tasilba, Chi, that all, all of them perform this kind of simulation. Finally, um, I, want, I want to highlight the work of Velasco et al, who developed the um, BGK modeling curvilinear coordinates um, that uh, is, uh, allows to perform a simulation in complex geometry uh, without interpolation schemes and make simulation uh, of a horror and a, two, a trumpet. Um, here, the uh, hell holes uh, cavity was simulated by Lattice Bolban edge noise with the deep hole uh, pattern. These two are uh, of uh, simulations. And uh, we also performed a simulation of a jet um, noise uh, with a little cylinder obstacle. And we obtained this kind of a spectrum. Okay, the remarks. If uh, the lattice Baldwin method have uh, a lot of um, uh, features that uh, are um, appropriate for acoustic simulation as different kinds of acoustic sources from ga Gaussian pulses to standing waves, white noise, trims, um, different boundary conditions, including a, a perfectly 
much uh, larger. The model can be uh, can be updated with more stable scheme, schemes as the multiple relaxation time, the regular regularized uh, lattice Boltzmann. Um, we have uh, some match techniques that can be very interesting for uh, acoustics. Mm, and uh, of course, hybrid models and turbulence, turbulence models. Mm. Okay, we have different advantage and drawbacks to, related to the use of lattice Boltzmann method. I think the computational cost is similar to more classical methods, but, but we have um, the possibility to uh, simulate at the same time the mean flow and the acoustic field. That in, I don't know if infinite element method uh, must be simulated and uh, accoplated. Um, meanwhile, in lattice Boltzmann can be in in uh, directly simulated. Mm, you can handle complex geometry with um, with lattice Boltzmann method. The drawbacks are uh, related all with the single relaxation time or uh, almost all of them. Then using a uh, uh, multi relaxation time, you can improve the method and this make a uh, suitable the, the lattice Boltzmann method to use in, in acoustic and specifically in aeroacoustic. Mm, okay, I think this is all. Uh, this is uh, the results of, uh, of one of our simulation with the edge tone. Um, after some time, you can see that the jet um, starts to oscillate, and this, uh, of course, is expected. And the frequency of the oscillations are related with the velocity of the of the jet, the and the distance uh, to the obstacle. Mm -hmm. We see that uh, this kind of simulation is very sensible to boundary conditions. Um, also, if you uh, put here some absorbing um, buffer, um, this recirculation of the of the vortices uh, can be simulated, and um, the oscillation of the jet is altered. Then, thanks to all, I, I know that is. Uh, a very uh, quick presentation, and um, I go very to the, very quick to the last diapositive here. Um, okay, and um, thank you, thank you all. And if you have uh, some some other works that uh, you can share with uh, our group, I. We're very uh, happy to, to include in, in, in our uh, literature review your work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bocanegra, for the nice presentation. Um, I think if you have a question, you can, uh, I mean, write in the chat since we are um, almost 10, more than five minutes uh, out of time. So uh, now it's coffee break. But I mean, feel free to discuss in the chat or oh, okay. you know, even, uh, even uh, openly. So now it's coffee break, and uh, if there, are, there is any question. Okay, thank you. I go to the chat and, and I'll read the the questions. Yeah.
I, I'm writing the answer for the questions in the chat. I don't know if uh, Professor Munoz is, is here. How we can get in touch. Uh, thanks. And Alexander, I I write into you an answer. Uh, yes, thank you. Oh, I mean, I, I, <clears throat> if if you have a chance, uh, maybe just uh, comment please on this question because maybe it's easier. Yes, yes. Um, around the the standing waves, I see in 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 the works that um, this kind of simulation can be performed um, by um, imposing an initial condition in in the density in the lattice mm -hmm. then uh, almost the the um, standing wave density is uh, um, the the density pattern using a uh, a wave pattern mm -hmm. is uh, imposed from the beginning okay. of course uh, you need to to perform the simulation with low viscosity because if don't the the wave dissipates mm. and disappear. Um, for now, our simulations are in in two dimension and mm -hmm. are bidimensional. But I see uh, that a lot of, of uh, simulations in three dimensions. Mm, I see. In in the last decade, uh, mm -hmm. prior to to two thousand and ten, is almost all was performing with uh, BGK D2 Kunan. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So the, I, maybe I comment on why, if you still have time a little bit, um, yes, yes. on the question. Uh, so the interest is that um, there are some works, also experimental works, where people use uh, acoustics uh, in forms of standing waves for trapping the particles. So if you have this, um, uh, front of the acoustic wave, so the acoustic pressure basically, then you can show that uh, you can trap the particles and manipulate them. Uh, so, so that's why it uh, seems for me uh, that you can also do this. Um, uh, and that's what, that was basically my question. So whether it's 2D or 3D doesn't matter in this sense. So it would be interesting maybe to really think of this uh how, i mean imagine you have a channel you induce two waves and you basically pump the wave such that you uh, support the standing wave somewhere in the middle and uh, put there some some let's say particles uh, yes yes and and i think that um, it's possible to to implement an hybrid model and put there a, a particle mm -hmm. um, and calculate the, the forces. Mm -hmm. Also, I think the, that it's possible to, to make the, the standing wave in, in the way that you uh, mentioned, that is mm -hmm. putting two waves, one upside and one, uh, mm -hmm. one at the top and one at the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 
we, we perform some some approaches and understand the way the pattern uh, emerge if mm -hmm. uh, the linear solves uh, mm -hmm. side and, and downside and uh, to perform this is is easy um, with the work of Began that mm -hmm. I mentioned um, he um, gives uh, the, the the formulas to perform the point source but also the line source mm -hmm. and I think mm -hmm. Line source is, can be, is possible. Can be done. Okay, I see. But so far, nobody yes, did um, in, in, in um, Japan, right? For our research, we don't we don't see something like that. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Of course, we are performing continually literature search, but for now, I in my know, I haven't seen this this kind of work and can be very interesting. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you want to to be in touch and, and we can yes, uh, right, we are open. Of course. Of course. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. It was very interesting already. Yes. 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 It's, it's very interesting. Uh, we performed with Lattice Boltzmann and some other things that can be relatively related about sedimentation of particles. Mm -hmm. We put some particles and gravitational sedimentation. Mm -hmm. uh, we perform different models for the gravitational sedimentations. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, leaving the um, um, the buoyancy force and the gravitational force fixed. Mm -hmm. but also, you can uh, put some other uh, um, condition as. If the volumetric concentration of particles uh, increments, there are mm -hmm. more aggregation, the cluster go big, and the uh, gravitational force increments. The, um, the sedimentation velocity increments in proportion with the uh, volumetric concentration of particles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, for now, we don't we don't think in couple the acoustic simulation with this, but uh, you you make me think that is possible and is very interesting to to make some that okay mm -hmm. uh, trap acoustically these tiny particles. Okay, so and, and, uh, and you can uh, couple uh, maybe with um, an hybrid model that is simulate the particle something like molecular dynamics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But also, it's possible to simulate um, the, the a concentration of particles with lattice Boltzmann method, mm -hmm. acoustical field, and mm -hmm. some other lattice for the particles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Anyway, I mean, it was very interesting to get uh, to know uh, what you are doing, and um, I will study a little bit now. I have information. Um, uh, your works and uh, um, I can uh, come back to you. So I'll start with. Oh, okay, thank you, thank you. Okay. I leave uh, my if, uh, my uh, email in the chat. Okay, very good. We mm -hmm. can keep in touch. Okay, great. Thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot. Yes. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, so I think we can start for the um, second part of this morning session. Uh, so the next speaker is uh, Dr. Jessica Padrone. Yes, um, good morning to everyone. Good morning. I think you have the right to share the screen. Uh, you can just try. Okay, can good. you see the screen? Yes, yes. Okay, so uh, should we speak about development of a multi-layer cascaded and cumulant co-based lattice Boltzmann model for uh, shallow water flows? So, please. Okay. Um... 
Thank you for the presentation. I'm Jessica Padrone. I come from Italy. I'm in the first year of my PhD at Nicola Cusano University in Rome. The work I'm going to present concerns the development of a multi-layer cascaded and cumulant collision operator-based lattice Boltzmann model for shallow water flow. And this is a preliminary work in progress. The aim of the project is to extend and improve the multi-relaxation time cascaded and cumulant lattice Boltzmann model uh, developed by Professor Venturi Di Francesco and Geyer to simulate dynamics of a multi-layer shallow water flow um, made of uh, layers of different density and to obtain a stratified horizontal flow velocity at various depths, avoiding the expansion of Stokes equation and to overcome the difficulties related to simulation of three-dimensional gravity currents, uh, especially in terms of uh, computational cost. To start, we focus our attention on the two-layer shallow water flow model. Uh, and uh, then after introducing the lattice Boltzmann model, we can see how the lattice Boltzmann equation become for two layer liquid. Then we see the external force implementation and uh, an, an adaptation of the benchmark problem of the Stoker dam break for two layers liquid. To start, uh, for simplicity, we have considered the two layer shallow water equation. Um, two layer shallow water equation. So um, we consider two uh, shallow layers um, for, uh, of different density are uh, row one and row two with the row one greater than row two and the same viscosity bounded by a free uh, surface described by uh, La Rocca in his paper. The thicknesses of the two layers are H1 and H2. And uh, mm, the, lower, uh, the lower layer is uh, uh, limited by a rigid bottom and uh, um, by a rigid bottom and by the surface surface with the upper layer. The latter is limited by a three surface as represented in figure. Uh, so, considered, val uh, considered valued the assumption, the usual assumption of the shallow water equation and uh, the depth of arranging of a Navier Stokes equation, we can obtain uh, uh, this um, um, separated. Um, uh, we can obtain these uh, uh, separated partial differential systems, uh, one for each liquid layer. So the two partial differential systems are coupled with each other only by means of the pressure force terms acting at the separation surface. And uh, we can define uh, R, the ratio of uh, densities. Initial conditions generally uh, refers to motion starting from a quotient configuration uh, with a given shape of the liquid layer thicknesses. And uh, boundary uh, conditions are imposed corresponding to rigid impermeable surface uh, where the velocity components uh, normal to the surface and the uh, uh, direction derivative of the liquid layer thicknesses along to the normal um, along the normal to the surface vanish in it. Uh, the partial differential systems uh, uh, presented together with initial and boundary condition um, represent a very difficult problem for numerical integration because of uh, uh, the loss of hyperbolicity and the onset of numerical instabilities. Uh, so the description of the flow made by the shallow water equation can be thought as a description based on average quantities conceptually obtained performing the averaging uh, over a large number of liquid particles uh, to set the probability uh, distribution functions, each of them representing the probability of finding a particle, a particle in the neighborhood with a given uh, position and a given velocities. So um, the evolution of these distribution functions is governed by uh, equation obtained by the famous kinetic Boltzmann equation, where um, F is uh, uh, correspond to the particle distribution functions, uh, represent the probability of finding a particle at, at position x at time t uh, for the allowed discrete speed direction, and omega is the collision operator, and uh, capital F is the external forces of the flow field. 
uh, in this work uh, we considered uh, um, uh, we can consider um, uh, uh, this pattern where uh, we are based on uh, nine direction the macroscopic variables uh, um, water rate and velocity can be recovered direct from first first order row moments of the prob probability distribution function uh, the fluid cinematic viscosity is a function of the relaxation rate and uh, um, um, function of relaxation rate and the speed of sound that is constant. Okay, but let's see uh, some advantages of our method. First, uh, first it's a versatile method applying different fields and uh, it allows to overcome stability problems of traditional approach BGK for low values of the viscosity and uh, um, we can slightly modify the algorithm uh, for each layer after selecting the appropriate equilibrium. And uh, mm, moreover, uh, we have a, a very flexibility on multi-scale working and uh, um, the innovative use of cumulant and cascaded methods allow to simulate large scale hydraulic problems. And um, uh, moreover, we have a direct interface with open source QGIS uh, that allows to um, set the information related to topography, initial condition, and boundary condition. Okay, consider now the lattice Boltzmann method to shallow water sets of equation that is defined in this way by La Roca. But uh, La Roca uses a single relaxation time model with a BGK approach, uh, and um, while we use a multi relaxation time cascaded and cumulant methods, so uh, these terms uh, for us is different. Last two terms is referred to external forces, where uh, phi represent the force exerted on layer by the other layer, and F represent the external force um, acted by a layer. Um, so we can see how macroscopic variables, thicknesses and velocities become for the two layers. Okay, in this work, we considered the cascaded model, which uses observable quantities, central moments, uh, defined in a frame co-moving with the fluid. To obtain central moments, statistically independent of each other, it is used a factorized central uh, moment method, theorized with the cumulant lattice Boltzmann method, uh, which at the same time oversteps the two problems of uh, statistical independence of the moment and hyperviscosity. Moreover, cascading and cumulant methods maintain a, a correct viscosity with second order convergence, convergence and uh, allows to overcome stability problems of a traditional approach BGK and uh, the conservation of physical link between the speed of sound and the viscosity. Uh, in our model, the, pres the presence of external force has been taken into account uh, in the streaming step and also in the transformation from central moments, um, uh, the transformation of central moment and the external force depend on the weight, which define I, how the force is distributed over the distribution. The macroscopic variables are transformed in this way, where this term uh, taking into account both external force, uh, for example, gravity, friction, and wind, but the uh, uh, force, force exerted on a layer by the other layer uh, that represent the interaction uh, between layers. Okay, we can. Uh, uh, we have a, uh, our flow chart model where uh, we first choose uh, uh, our layers number, set the initial condition for each layer. Then after calculating the external force and uh, uh, interaction between layers uh, and uh, updating macroscopic variables, we can choose, um, we can choose between uh, cascaded or cumulant uh, methods. Okay, uh, last uh, we, um, um, we have an adaptation of the problem to a, bench to a benchmark test case, the Stoker Dam Break, uh, where uh, um, we can have uh, different levels uh, with the same densities and the same level 
uh, with different density row one and row two with bound ba bounce back boundary condition at rigid boundary. As I say at uh, the beginning, this is a um, work in progress. So uh, the next steps are verifying the accordance between the numerical solution and the benchmark test case, then uh, uh, extending the model for um, for bidimensional multi-layer shallow water and steady flows on a given topography and uh, testing in response to different risk spacing uh, to uh, model singularity and improve calculation performances and uh, efficiency of the code. Um, after all, uh, we can uh, finally simulate phenomena commonly encountered both in environmental and uh, industrial fluid mechanic problems as uh, gravity currents. Thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Pa um, uh, Padrone, for the um, nice presentation. So I think we have uh, uh, a little bit less than 10 minutes, so we have a good amount of time for questions. If you have any, um, please either uh, write in the chat or, you know, intervene. Okay. Is, is there any? Well, if possible, I would have a, a curiosity uh, to ask you, yeah. Jessica, please. Uh, yes. What about the computational burden of your procedure? So do you find it uh, um, heavy from a computational point of view? Um, light? Do you experience some numerical limits, for instance, in the regimes that you have uh, simulated, uh, some numerical issues, uh, some numerical uh, um, problems that you have faced in, uh, during your work, please? Uh, actually not, because uh, as I said at the beginning, this is a, a work in progress, so um, uh, this is the next steps of our, uh, our work. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Other questions? So if, if not, I think we can uh, just move to the next presentee, um, Dr. Marisol Ripoll. Um, now I'm on mute. Thanks. Yep. So you can see me, you can hear me. Yes. Hello. Yes. Uh, let's see if I can also share the screen. Yes, I think you could just. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, and now you see it also in... Um, Unfortunately. Uh, okay, so yeah. just a quick introduction. So uh, Dr. Marisol Ripoll will speak about self forensic swimmers, uh, hydrodynamics versus uh, forensic Brownian dynamics in simulations. So please. So thanks uh, for the presentation and thanks for the organization of, of this meeting uh, online once more, I have to say. Uh, so this work uh, is uh, the PhD, uh, mainly the PhD project of uh, Sergi Rocabonet, who could not be uh, here today. So I will introduce you to these uh, self foretic swimmers that we study by a combination of hydrodynamics and uh, foretic Brownian dynamic simulations in order to, uh, to understand the, different, the, the influence of, of hydrodynamics. So, oops, yeah, can we see, I wait, 
Yeah. So the motivation is that we are interested in active matter. And let me remind you that active matter is a matter which is made by systems that have elements that are able to move, to self-propel, to take energy from their environment and, and perform a persistent motion. So there are many exposing large scales like fish or birds. And in the micro scale, there are many systems like uh, different types of bacteria, algae, or uh, the components of of the, of the cytoskeleton inside the cell that are nice examples. But the question is if we can make uh, a soft matter system that is uh, man-made and can display some of these nice properties which are of systems out of equilibrium. Here you see an example of a gold platinum colloid in a peroxide uh, solution in which you see indeed that these particles are not moving brownianly but they have these uh, persistent motion and you see that they are making this aggregate. So the question is which factors are controlling the behavior of these systems? Uh, if we can design, so the same as nature is making uh, systems with different properties, if we can design also systems that have uh, different behaviors, and of course, oh, don't know uh, here. If, uh, how can computer simulations help us to, uh, to understand these systems? So how can we build uh, uh, these micro swimmers? In reality, there are more than one answer, but one that is uh, the one uh, we are interested on and that it's actually one of the dominant answers is phoresis. Phoresis is a phenomena. Uh, by which if you have a system with an intrinsic uh, gradient, which can be temperature, it can be any type of density or uh, electric uh, charge or something like this, there is a drift of the particles that go against or towards the gradient. So if you imagine this is in general, and now if you imagine a particle that has uh, this asymmetry, for example, in the case of gold silica, and you illuminate this particle with laser, the gold that has larger uh, heat conductivity will become warmer than the rest, and the silica will react to this temperature gradient going against or towards the gradient. Similar, if you have a particle on the right, I hope you are able to see my pointer that has a catalytic reaction or any type of reaction in the surface, you can see that the distribution of the components is different along the particle, and that will make uh, a reaction, this phoretic reaction towards or against the gradient. So we have that if you have a system with a particle asymmetry that has a type of a fuel that may come from light or from uh, any uh, chemical component. This produces the solvent gradient and this translates in the particle motion. So, and this was what we were seeing here, which factors are controlling the behavior. We have that in one or another way, we have this self-propelled motion. And since we are in the micro scale, we have thermal noise. The first uh, ways of studying this uh, system were the so-called uh, active Brownian particles that were considering only these two ingredients. But the truth is that uh, if in many systems there are other things which are important, for example, aphoretic interactions between particles. So one particle might react to the gradient by another one, and this can be attractive or repulsive. And furthermore, we have hydrodynamic interactions. We have hydrodynamic interactions by some approaches are only considered in the far field, by others also in the near field, and we want to de-entangle how uh, they, uh, these, these contributions might, might affect the system. So for this, we perform uh, simulations with full hydrodynamics, and as a different to the rest of the meeting, we are not making lattice movement, but a method that it's called multiparticle collision dynamics. So I've introduced this method a couple of times in the DSFP meeting. I've had this nice opportunity. Uh, now there is a video on YouTube if somebody is interested. And uh, very briefly, uh, these particles uh, uh, just move uh, without a lattice in principle. They can move, uh, propagate in space by uh, their positions and velocity without first for some time without being aware of each other and then they are sorted into into boxes and they are going to collide with the particles inside this box the collision 
is that the relative velocity of the particle to the center of mass is rotated by a, an angle. And this angle, the axis that this rotation is, is made is, uh, is a stochastic, is different in uh, neighboring boxes. And then you put back the, the velocity of the center of mass. This was very fast, but you might understand that by choosing this random uh, direction to make the, the rotation, you have a stochastic uh, interactions and this means that thermal noise is introduced in the system by the way that this collision is made mass and momentum is conserved and these uh, can be shown in many papers has been shown that translate into proper hydrodynamic interactions and also kinetic energy is conserved which means that energy can be propagated and that you can implement temperature gradients. So the way of implementing uh, our, our colloidal particles is by putting this uh, layer of, uh, by hybridizing the method with molecular dynamics. You have molecular dynamics of the colloidal particles and of the solvent around it. And you can also uh, implement temperature gradients just by renormalizing, by deciding that there is an area that it's going to be your hot area and somehow Somewhere else, the energy has to be taken out. If you want to take it uniformly, you use this global thermalization. So usually, and um, I like to point uh, this uh, last uh, thing here, uh, typically more for people not doing uh, simulations, but it's taking into account that we have hydrodynamic amphoresis through these collisions. So we are not imposing an equation of, uh, uh, of propagation of mass, momentum of energy, but it comes the hydrodynamics and the phoresis both are emerging from the interactions that we have and from the solvent gradients. So, uh, and I like to show very briefly this, uh, this other uh, sketch to show you that in order to get these properly significant, we really need much larger systems. So the colloids are very large and interact with many of these collisions. So this code has to be made uh, a little bit effective, and the simulations that I saw you today are being done with these uh, codes, uh, lamps base code. So, but the question is are these solvent effects relevant? We know that we are going to have both phoresis and hydrodynamics. Phoresis, uh, I was saying there are two types of colloids, those that go towards. Uh, the gradient, namely to the hot, if we are thinking about the temperature gradient, and those that go still cold against the, the gradient. If you make a swimmer, and we like these dimer particles, a particle that it's uh, cold, hot, and then this will propel towards the, the hot particle. And if there is a neighboring particle, this is also going to feel, uh, so these, uh, this phoretic particle will feed the heat of its own particle and also of the neighbor. So just due to phoresis, we have this attraction between particles. And you can understand if it's a phobic, it will be a repulsion and the motion in the opposite direction. And as I was saying, if we do MPC simulations, we beyond this uh, phoretic heat attraction, we have uh, uh, the effect of the solvent. And here uh, I put one example of these asymmetric uh, particles. And you see that the flow field is pretty in both. So it's a little bit polar type. There is lateral repulsion, but it's not just a polar, it's much more elaborate and we change many things we, we are changing here. I guess so uh, a similar swimmer, but changing the size of the hot particle here is just larger, but you see that it's not only that it will move faster or slower, it is that the flow field around it is quite different. Okay, so uh, how to de-entangle the, the effect of, uh, of hydrodynamic sunphoresis, because we have everything included in the hydrodynamic ones. One solution, the first solution that you might think about is, okay, you had active Brownian models, you add this uh, attraction or repulsion of the, of the phoresis, and in principle, uh, that will yield, uh, and you can tune them, but in principle, this cannot be done in real systems. And we want to go uh, a step beyond and do this a little bit better. And that's why we define what we are calling just phoretic Brownian dynamics model, which is designed for these type of phoretic systems. So the idea here, and I am seeing all the time here, uh, the idea is that you have just overdamped Langevin dynamics in each of the two bits. And, uh, where we have just four different in the two bits and a term of, of noise, which is just white noise, which will come through related with the bit mobility. 
So we have two types of particles and the forces. Uh, so one is going to be a hot and the phoretic beads. And the, the hot beads and the phoretic beads are the same in the sense that they need a potential that keeps them together, such that you have your, your dimer and excluded volume interactions if they are neighboring ones. The hot bead doesn't have anything else because in principle it doesn't thin any, tem any temperature gradient. So that's all that you need for the hot bead. But the phoretic bead needs to calculate the effect of all the phoretic interactions. And that's the interesting part of it. And how do we implement phoresis? We know that uh, these phoretic interactions is a constant factor times the temperature gradient that the system is filling. And that's uh, this constant factor is the thermal uh, diffusion coefficient, which is characteristic of each uh, particle. And the temperature gradient we can calculate through the Laplace equation simply. So if you have a situation with one particle or many more, you can say, okay, uh, I calculate this um, by, uh, by uh, this pairwise approximation. You have that the temperature decays like one over R and the gradient, uh, you get another one over R. So it is. Uh, it can be calculated like the inverse of the of the distance squared. And uh, then the only thing we have to fit is this alpha, which we can fit to the uh, hydrodynamic uh, simulations by fitting the the phoretic velocity. So since we know the phoretic velocity in hydrodynamic interactions, we uh, we plug it in. In order that they are the same, we calculate the alpha that does this, and we want to match also the decay number such that we need that the rotational diffusion is the same. And we have here the, the bit mobility that allows us to tune also these factors. So we can have simulations that have the same uh, pecle and velocity, Brownian and hydrodynamics. And let me just point out here in this sketch that, uh, so note that if you have, for example, here a central particle, since you are calculating the temperature gradient with all the neighboring heat sources, the temperature gradient uh, will not, so this will not be a persistent motion in one direction or having attraction, but it is vanishing. So it is much more related to, uh, to what is happening in hydrodynamics. Also, self propulsion and phoretic attraction cannot be uh, independently varied. And you are adding also certain top of the particles because we have these, um, uh, the interaction with, with the beads. And finally, I can show you some results of simulations done with hydrodynamics in the supercomputer uh, with all the solvent around. So, and here uh, we have our phoretic uh, uh, Brownian simulations, which we actually perform in a local computer because they are quite, uh, quite efficient and quite cheap. Uh, you see that they are both moving uh, with the peak to the front, as I would expect. And uh, in principle, they are aggregating because they have these uh, phoretic attractions. But there are a subtle important difference in a way, I would say, in the way that these uh, are made. Here you can see, for example, that all the tips are made towards outside, while here they are towards inside. And if we want to understand better, these are the same movies. We have to think how uh, the flow field around these particles are. And here you can see that you get this attraction in the back and this repulsion in the front when hydrodynamics are included. And for example, if you look at the, at the swimming at, at low densities, you can see that if there are hydrodynamics, they like to swim behind each other and are a little bit displaced because they are feeling the attraction brought by, the, by this flow field. And this is something that you don't see at all in the simulations with Brownian dynamics. In Brownian dynamics, what happens is that two particles find the tip, as you see here. They like the heat of each other, they feel this attraction, and they propel together because there is a component that brings them forward. And if you uh, look how these clusters start to, to nucleate, you will start to see that they, they are quite different with and without hydrodynamics. This is hydrodynamics and this is without. Uh, because here they, the tips are finding and then particles start to feel this backflow attraction from which they, uh, they start to, uh, to, to make these clusters. And then when more particles, they, they start to assemble. And this is completely different when you have Brownian, uh, these uh, Brownian uh, dynamic simulations um, in which they, uh, they, they just uh, get in towards the, the, the heat source. So um, 
I think my time is running and uh, uh, we can do a lot of uh, quantitative analysis and comparison of these ones, but today uh, I will not show them to you. The main idea is that if you have hydrodynamics and brown dynamics in this particular system, we see that uh, uh, structural changes are being formed. Hydrodynamics enhances a little bit, it makes a little bit faster, but it's not very significant. Uh, I forgot to say that uh, the theory of, uh, of uh, Brownian dynamics in which uh, hydrodynamics is, uh, so the, uh, this ADP, this active Brownian particles with uh, far field hydrodynamics says in principle that hydrodynamics diminishes aggregation. Here you can see that it's not the case. And here now I show you a case in which uh, it's different. You saw that the flow fields here were very different. And here what you see is that without hydrodynamics, these clusters are hardly being formed. So here, there is a very important enhance of aggregation that for which you, you need the hydrodynamics flow field. So here the difference is, is quite significant and we are playing now with, uh, with different shapes of these, uh, of these streamers. And you see here that the collapse is much more effective while in the absence of uh, Brownian dynamics, in the absence of hydrodynamics, uh, there are only very small clusters being formed. And then if uh, we have uh, this uh, repulsive interaction, it's moving in the opposite direction. And you see that it happens completely the opposite. So here, in order to understand what is happening, we need to look at the flow fields. And now I will not show them to you, but just let me say that in this particular case, hydrodynamics diminishes aggregation. So we cannot make a general statement of how hydrodynamics is, but you really need to understand uh, each particular system independence. Then there are, I like to show this, this other system, which is a super self-propelled particle that we make in this traffic light type of, uh, of, uh, of shape. And in this particular case, hydrodynamics has very little influence. So we have the expensive simulations and the cheap ones, and there are some subtle differences, but they are not, not very, uh, very strong. But this, of course, we didn't know really in advance. And with this, I'm at the end of my presentation. I want to say that this combination of multi-particle collision dynamics with uh, foretic brown dynamics, we find that it's a very useful tool to determine the importance of hydrodynamics. And about the results, hydrodynamics, not always, but they can really have drastic effects. And both far field and near field uh, hydrodynamics are relevant. And from the applications point of view, I would like to say that for ESIs, playing with uh, different for ESIs and particle shape, you can tune the systems of uh, these uh, synthetic active particles, which we like very much. Let me acknowledge uh, I mean, Chen Yan and Martin Wagner are participating in an early stage of this work and their contributions are very appreciated. What you have seen, as I said, is mainly the PhD work of Sergi Rokabonet. And uh, we, of course, acknowledge uh, funding from the DFT in Germany with this uh, micro streamer uh, program and very generous uh, allocation of computing time by, by uh, UREC. And with this, I would like to thank you for attention. And I hope uh, next time we can, uh, we can meet. And with uh, this, I'm happy to take any question you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this very nice talk. And uh, we're open to questions, so please. So I, I would have uh, one question, sorry. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting, you know, the, some, the simulations you show about the hydrodynamic effect, which can be, as you said, very drastic. So sometimes uh, almost the opposite. In some cases, so aggregation. In other cases, um, the aggregation is completely lost. Uh, I think you know that you know the, one of the open problems in this active matter is uh, you know how fast this domain grow, you know, the kinetic of phase separation and the role played by dynamic interaction. Have you ever uh, observed, you know, or studied better, the, um, you know, if the, this, this phase separation is somewhat arrested uh, at some point, uh, or if there, there is some um, effect on the, key, on the exponents of the domain growth? Um, uh, I, uh, I mean, I can show you a transparency that fell down because of the time. We have not studied that precisely, okay. is the answer. 
but for example here so we can study quantitatively all types of quantities and uh, we have more but let me show you here the size of the larger cluster okay, okay. so here yeah. you have the how this larger cluster is growing with and without hydrodynamics yeah and in principle although the mechanism we saw inside and outside is different here you can see that for this system hydrodynamics is what i was saying goes faster than without hydrodynamics it's of course always very tricky to make the comparison with the right uh, time units but uh, yeah. i think we have uh, we have reached here a nice way of comparing because this is simulation units divided by uh, by a ballistic time which is something that can be um so the time that the particle takes to propagate its own uh, radius or diameter which can be compared with uh, simulations or with uh, experiments so you can see this in a way as seconds if you think about a particle of one uh, a micrometer uh, moving at a one micrometer per second yeah. this exponent and this character so it could be done better it could be done more exhaustively okay. but there is a difference by the effect of hydrodynamics and this can be quantified in each system yeah okay thank you that's very interesting you know it's a very open mm -hmm. problem about you know how this domain grow the exponents of the land scale you know that's, uh, that's mm -hmm. very interesting thank you okay. i think there is a question yeah. in the chat by paul deller yeah yeah okay Paul Delar, Paul, hello, Paul. Do you use something like a fast multiple? Is that for me? Oh, yes. Yes, that's, that's, for, that's for you. Hello. Uh, for the pairwise interaction modeling the temperature in the Brownian theoretic model, or is your particle number too small? It, my particle number is too small to bother. So <laughs> we, the simulations I've shown you, I don't know how long it takes, but it's very little. And we can make them much bigger. And we can make even the, everything can be optimized, but the aim of these simulations was to make something as close as possible to the, to the uh, hydrodynamic case. And in the hydrodynamics, we cannot go much faster. The, of course, if the Brownian dynamics without, so just these lines can be made to much larger system, the hydrodynamics that is the limit that, uh, is, it's what is limited if you want the comparison. What is limited if you Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Paul, I cannot hear you. Sorry, I just said thank you for answering my question. Thank you for answering my question. Okay. That's uh you are okay. very welcome. Thanks for making it. That's uh you are very welcome. Thanks for making it. I mean the only thing I would like to add is that okay. if you Brown dynamics doesn't make a difference with uh, with hydrodynamic reactions, then it can be a powerful method by itself to predict properties of, of systems with theoretic interactions. Hello, Marisol. Hello, Kai. Nice to see you. Hi, nice to see you too. A uh, very nice talk. Uh, actually, I have a question. So, in your case, like, do you think in the 3D case, uh, the hydrodynamic in, hydrodynamic simulation will be quite different from the Brownian dynamic simulation? Uh, in what kind of sense? Because your case is like 2D simulation. I mean, this is, uh, I don't know if I showed you here, this is this quasi 2D confinement. So we have, yeah. uh, we have the system, uh, so it's 3D. Actually, I think these flow fields are measured in, uh, in 3D. Uh, but when it's in, in quasi 2D, it is not too different, I would say. The 3D system we made also in the past with Martin uh, simulations with that. Um, oh. It is different because of the rearrangement, because uh, uh, you have particles in the front, in the back, and then they can, uh, so somehow they cluster more. And mm. we have not done so far brown and dynamic simulations in the 3D systems. I but uh, of course, that would also be uh, very interesting. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. okay. 
So thank you. Let's thank again, uh, Dr. Report for this very uh, stimulating presentation. And uh, um, I think we can move to the last speaker of today's um, session, uh, Professor Giacomo Falcucci from University of Tor Vergata. I think Giacomo, you should be able to share the screen. Yes, I'm here. I'm trying to share my screen. Yes. Uh, at the moment. Okay. Okay. This one. Okay. I think that now you should see my screen. I start with my presentation. Do you see it? Not yet, uh, at least me. Not yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you should see it. Okay, if you see it, it's fine. Sorry, my, okay. my case is still loading, but uh, yeah, it's okay, so. Okay. okay, so thank you very much, Adriano, for uh, the, this nice introduction. I'm Giacomo Facucci from the University of Rontor Vergata. I will show you our results on uh, our simulations, uh, HPC simulations on uh, Eupletella aspergillum. Um, and we simulated the uh, real life conditions of a living organism. Um, I would like to thank all my co authors. Uh, at the end, I will. Be... Now the presentation yeah, okay. is there. No, now it's fine. Yeah. Okay, 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 that's fine. Okay, uh, I will give uh, the credits to, uh, along my presentation to my co-authors. We did this work in collaboration with NYU, uh, with the, the University of Western Australia, the University of Tusha, our uh, gracious host today, and uh, the Italian Institute of Technology with Stavros Tucci. So uh, just a brief uh, outline of the presentation, I will describe uh, the, what is Eupletella aspergillum? Not all of us uh, know what is, uh, me neither, before um, uh, getting in touch with it. Uh, how did we implement our uh, uh, code, the simulations results, uh, discussions and conclusions? Eupletella aspergillum is a deep sea sponge. It is a very beautiful living organism and uh, it belongs to the Philom porifera, so it is one of the most ancient uh, uh, living organism uh, uh, in the world. And uh, it is a deep sea sponge, so it dwells uh, in the bottom of the ocean uh, at depths of uh, between 100 and 1,000 meters. And uh, in Japan, it is called uh, Cairo Duketsu, that is together for eternity, because inside this glass skeleton, the um, Eupletella uh, hosts uh, a couple of uh, breeding shrimp, uh, shrimps that uh, remain uh, trapped for life together inside uh, this uh, beautiful uh, sponge. So they enter through the holes when they are uh, very small, they grow inside and they remain uh, trapped inside. And there is a symbiosis between the two organisms. Okay, we started uh, asking us uh, ourselves uh, um, what are the food dynamic performance of this uh, uh, beautiful organism because it has been uh, uh, really widely studied since its discovery at the end of the 1900, uh, 19th century. And uh, um, it, uh, we dealt with these original um, articles uh, from the late uh, uh, 19th century, and it was very beautiful to read the discovery of this uh, um, deep sea sponge, which is characterized by exceptional structural properties. Its skeleton is made by silica, so it is uh, should it should be as brittle as uh, and fragile as glass. Uh, uh, but this uh, uh, sponge shows and exhibits some structural performance uh, that has uh, uh, attracted the attention of uh, uh, scientists and engineers uh, uh, since its discovery. No one before uh, has ever tried to simulate the food dynamics, but the structural properties are, are very well known from um, the literature. And there is a, hi a hierarchy of layers um, of glass silica and organic material that during the development of this organism in its life uh, provide these remarkable structural properties. So 
the full scale simulation of this uh, organism has never been uh, tried before due to its complexity. And we did it, and I am very proud and happy to say that our work was published in Nature in uh, last July. And I thank really very much my co-authors for uh, helping me in achieving this uh, very important uh, goal. And uh, we did extreme flow simulations, and we found that uh, the skeletal structure of the Bretella has evolved uh, also mm, on the... Mm, uh, sparked by the uh, influence of uh, hydrodynamic fields that surround this deep sea spot. So, first of all, we started by collecting the environmental conditions in which this organism lives. And we had to collect the data from the very de uh, deep sea uh, ocean. Uh, in the Pacific Ocean, many works report the uh, values of uh, water density and uh, viscosity at uh, the depths that we are uh, considering between 100 and uh, uh, 1,000 meters. And uh, un uh, the, the, um, the sponge is anchored to the seabed, so it prolongs from the, the seabed and it is immersed in what is basically the boundary layer of the uh, deep ocean. And it experiences flow velocities, which fortunately have been charted, fortunately for us, luckily for us, in the range of 0 to uh, 10 to minus 1 meter per second. This is the order of magnitude of the velocities in the first uh, 30, 40 centimeters above the sea, um, the, 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 the sea, um, the basement. And uh, um, given the um, dimension, no, no, in my case, it's still, still on. No, no, in my case, it's ah, okay, still, still, still okay. on. So uh, the, the, the Reynolds number we computed is in the order of uh, 2000, okay? So this gives an idea of the regime that this uh, organism feels. We have done a reconstruction, a thorough reconstruction of the geometry, starting from the works in the literature. As I said before, there is a hierarchy very uh, specific and very peculiar of these species, the uh, fundamental um, constituent of this sponge, which in their rearrangement provide the uh, external structure, the skeletal motif. And we reconstructed it uh, with our CAD, thanks to Pierluigi Fanelli from Tusha University, and we achieved an accuracy of 0.2 millimeters in this structure. Then we run our simulations on uh, two HPC architectures, on Marconi KNL and on Marconi 100, uh, Marconi 100, which was ranked number nine in the top 500 uh, um, supercomputers in the world at the time of the simulations. I uh, was uh, granted a, this computational uh, grant from Cineca and NSKB, and uh, we were able to run uh, our simulation on uh, up to one eighth of the entire computational facility, thank, thanks to our co author, friend, and colleague, Giorgio Amati, who has a very large credit in achieving this, uh, the results that I show you in the next, uh, in the next slides. So I show you immediately uh, one of the uh, most uh, uh, intriguing results that we obtained. We uh, simulated different flow regimes, uh, 100, uh, Reynolds corresponding to uh, Reynolds 100, 500, uh, 1000, uh, 1500, and uh, uh, 2000. And uh, here you see a result of the flow field uh, at Reynolds 2000 with a computational uh, lattice spacing of 0.2 millimeters, the same as the a maximum detail that we achieved in meshing the solid structure. As you see, here we have a very um, intricate pattern of uh, uh, fluid uh, streak lines. The blue contours are those of helicity, while the velocity magnitude follows this uh, color pattern. In this simulation, uh, we used, we employed a grid of 50 billion lattice sites. And it took us a, a huge amount of computational resources to achieve, uh, to conclude, to uh, achieve uh, the, the, the results of uh, accomplishing this simulation. 
The, uh, what was interesting that uh, according to our simulations, we found uh, some very interesting and uh, um, complicated fluid structures, uh, vortical patterns downstream uh, the, um, the, the sponge and inside its body cavity. Moreover, looking uh, with a little bit more uh, accuracy at, the, at this image, we see that the intricacy, the intermittency in the flow field uh, arises downstream, but is delayed, delayed downstream. So here the flow field is more intricate than close to the sponge, which is something that immediately attracted our attention and we decided to investigate most thoroughly this aspect. So we created four partial or derived geometries with the uh, um, um, periodic boundary conditions on top and bottom. And we started from a plane cylinder that was our basic uh, test case in order to validate our uh, code, our uh, simulations, uh, what was happening at the different flow regimes, uh, so on and so forth. And we derived uh, different geometries. This is the final one from the actual Eupletella Spergy. Then we had a cylinder with the same helical ridges as the uh, actual Eupletellasperjilum. We had a um, porous cylinder that was uh, created by the, um, the porous structure of the skeletal structure of Eupletella, but without the helical ridges. And then a periodic um, model that resembles the tube of Eupletella, which is provided by the porous structure inside below and above the helical ridges, the same as those of Eupletella. So we didn't consider here the finiteness of the height of the Eupletella and its anchorage to the, to the sea bottom, okay? Uh, we obtained these fields, I hope that my computer is able to let you see what happens. Here you see the solid cylinder and the structure re resembling the Opletella Spergillum uh, actual skeletal motifs uh, at increasing Reynolds numbers. So you see here what happens, what happens at uh, Reynolds 100, the two structures behave almost identically, but as Reynolds number increases, you can see that uh, the, uh, the standard patterns of uh, incipient turbulent flow uh, um, are apparent in the case of the cylinder. These are the porticity contours for both geometries. While we see that the porous structure with helical ridges is characterized by a sort of uh, uh, bubble of quietness, uh, an almost quiescent zone downstream, which is very interesting. And then several diameters downstream, the uh, Eupletella, the uh, intermittency is uh, catastrophic as it, it must be a train of 2000. Okay? So this was very interesting for us because we saw that the effect of the fenestre, that is the um, openings in the, uh, in the sponge tube, and the presence of the ridges, uh, sparked this remarkable difference between a solid cylinder and a Pretella small. Putting a probe downstream, uh, two and a half diameters downstream, we saw that uh, um, the presence of these skeletal motifs uh, provides an abatement, an abating effect on the uh, flow field, um, especially in, moreover in, uh, in the velocity magnitude and of course the vorticity. As you can see here, you can see that the uh, darker uh, pattern is that provided by the cylinder that at Reynolds 2000 is characterized by a turbulent wave downstream, while the presence of both the holes and the ridges provides a very uh, abating effect, uh, a remarkable abating effect, uh, especially on the set plane. So the, the flow becomes uh, essentially planar on X and Y downstream the, the sponge. And uh, however, despite this uh, planarity of the wake, uh, you have also an abating effect on the two components, X and Y. 
this is clear um, more clear here in which we uh, in this slide we represent uh, the um, polar diagrams of ux and ui for the four geometries at the different Reynolds numbers so the colors uh, of the, the points are just the um, due to the different Reynolds numbers and you can see that this ordered uh, polar diagram for the cylinder immediately breaks in breaks after Reynolds 100 while in the presence of holes and ridges it remains even at larger values of Reynolds okay so so what happens downstream this was our uh, question uh, looking at the entropy and helicity fields downstream you see the helicity in blue and the entropy in uh, red and black you can see that we confirm the presence of this quiescent region that is highlighted by these uh, black lines, uh, which extends for some diameters downstream. And this quiet region reflects on the overall hydrodynamic stress that the uh, sponge experiences. So um, the drag is uh, um, remarkably lower in the case of the two porous models, P1 is the sponge without ridges and P2 is the sponge with ridges, is lower than that of S1. S1 is the cylinder. But we must say that we here we found something that was actually expected, but we didn't think of it at the beginning. So the sponge without ridges performs hydrodynamically much better than the sponge with ridges. You can see it here. I don't know if you see my uh, my mouse, okay, pointer. Here you have the sponge without ridges, so the uh, porous structure uh, plane without ridges. And uh, the pentagons are the actual Euplectella model. So according to the stresses experienced by the uh, living organism, we asked whether the helical ridges would have been just detrimental for its hydrodynamic performance, yet they are known to provide uh, a structural uh, stiffness to the structure, to the, to the skeletal uh, structure of the, this sponge. So they are needed from a structural point of view. But are they just detrimental from the hydrodynamic point of view? And the very interesting answer that we found is no. Why no? Because uh, what happens inside? Here you can see in the above the, the velocity field with this color pattern and in the second half of both these um, um, images in this panel you see the vorticity field the the white structures are those related to the q criterion so where q is just larger than zero which is basically one of the most accepted um, definitions of uh, what a vortex is Okay, so here you can see that the uh, pattern of the, uh, the geometry of the Euplectella with the holes and ridges is characterized by a very complex internal flow, which is not present in the case of the purely porous structure with, with the same porous structure of the Euplectella, but without the ridges. So these ridges must uh, have a, an hydrodynamic function as well, which is to, as we saw, measuring uh, the uh, vorticity and the elicity and uh, the uh, Q values inside the body cavity of the sponge, is to amplify the vertical structures inside the body cavity in order to do what? To increase the time, the residence time of the flow inside the body cavity and this is an, a purely biological benefit because the increasing the um, the residence time provides more time for the sponge to feed and for gamete encounter for sexual reproduction okay we understood that the sexual the reproduction of this organism is very complicated they, they have many many ways i didn't know but there are many ways so they are both um, hermaphrodites and reproduce for sexual uh, encounter of the gametes um, and the 
increase the residence time that we quantified here, you can see that P2 is the geometry with porosity and helical ridges, while P1 is the porous geometry without helical ridges. And we have a dramatic increase in uh, the residence time inside the body cavity. So we quantified all these aspects, both downstream and inside, and we were elated to see that our HPC simulations could be of uh, benefit for our um, biological um, biologist uh, colleagues. Okay, so concluding, uh, the um, we did a, a state of the art HPC simulations of the full skeleton of this glass sponge in its real environmental conditions. We saw and quantified the remarkable for dynamic performance linked to its skeletal motifs, and we. Um, De derived this novel approach that with the, 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 the coming and next generation of exascale computing uh, maybe can open a new path of uh, uh, interdisciplinary investigations uh, conjugating biology, physics, and engineering. Okay, so at the end, I, I must, and I, I'm very happy to thank all my co authors, uh, Professor Maurizio Porfiri from NYU. Giovanni Polverino from the University of Western Australia. We were all Italians, but dislocated in three continents. Dr. Giorgio Ramadi, without whom we could have never run all these simulations. Bessering Cluster, my friends and colleagues from uh, Ator Vergata University, who helped me in uh, understanding and uh, managing all the data. Pierluigi Fanelli designed all the simulation, all the um, geometries. And Sauro Succi helped us in uh, coordinating all the efforts together with Maurizio Porfiri. Has been, they have been uh, really amazing and uh, uh, absolutely fantastic. So thanks for your kind attention and here for your uh, questions. Thank you, thank you very much, Giacomo, for this. Thank you, very thank you very much, Giacomo, for this very beautiful. So, uh, I think hey, you're ready. I see some, uh, yes, I see some uh, question from Anastasia Vedepelkina. Uh, what boundary conditions for LVM used in geometry? Uh, yes, uh, thanks for the questions. Of course, uh, we uh, worked uh, uh, very much on uh, the implementation. For the periodic uh, geometries, we uh, used uh, an inflow and a pressure outlet with the uh, inflow with a given velocity, so velocity inlet and pressure outlet. And uh, all the other um, walls of the computational box were periodic. For the complete model, that is the first, um, the first image that I showed you, I can I just uh, try to go back to the slide in case uh, I, my computer doesn't uh, die. Um, here you see that we have the complete skeleton and uh, mm, we had the sea mm, floor, which is a wall non-slip. Then we had periodicity on all the other walls, a velocity inlet and the pressure out. Okay, of course, this is a, just a very brief extraction of the computational domain, which was enormous, as I told you, huge, as I told you before, and uh, it required uh, the adoption of uh, uh, 512 nodes, computational nodes, with uh, uh, V100 GPUs, four V100 GPUs on each. Okay, I hope I have answered the questions of Anastasia, by Anastasia. The sponge wall boundaries are uh, wall mostly which is quite uh, uh, a, a quite accurate uh, um, uh, representation of their wall because they are uh, made by silica. So they are, uh, the, the solid part is not porous. Then there are all these tiny uh, holes and uh, irregularities, if you would like to, to uh, call them like this. We have also done a thorough analysis on the presence of wounds and scars because some of these uh, sponges have been uh, um, taken from, uh, the uh, fishermen and they showed uh, some wounds and scars and we also uh, accounted for them. Perhaps there was Perhaps a question, was a question by George Ramati. Uh, ah, George, the end, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I may have. Some point it is the end. I don't know whether. 
because uh, if Georgia wants to intervene, it's of course welcome otherwise. No, sorry, raised the, the end by mistake. Okay, okay, no problem. It's okay, okay, there is a Marisol, Marisol has a question, please. Um, very um, uh, impressive work and nice to work. Nice, uh, thanks for it. I missed, maybe you said it. Do you consider the response is fixed or it can also move? Fixed or it can also move? This is a very good question. Thank you very much. The sponge is fixed. Actually, in the um, real um, organism, it is anchored with the spicules to the seabed. It has a, a small um, capability of uh, um, bending in the flow, but we uh, have also uh, quantified the forces that it is uh, it experiences with these very low velocities in the order of centimeters per second. And given its porous structure, the bending in the seafloor can be negligible. Our biologists, um, biologists, uh, biologist colleague um, confirmed us that the, the possibility of bending is really uh, not important, can be neglected. I mean, just, I mean, as, just as an academic I, curiosity, but I guess if it would be able to bend, if it would be a little bit more flexible, I guess that the flow would change dramatically. So dramatically, it would change importantly, and probably it would be less favorable because usually uh, evolution is very smart. So if it yes. cannot bend, could it be that it's because of something? Well, okay. Um, this, uh, uh, the possibility of bending is just related to this point. So the rest of the structure is completely uh, rigid. Okay. So it can just move around this anchorage and very few degrees. So this, uh, we, we plan to um, investigate also this aspect that was completely out of the possibility of making a moving mesh, given the computational resources needed just to make the fixed study at these this different ranges. Oh, I'm looking forward then. Very interesting. Thank oh, you. I'm looking forward then. Okay. Very thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think there is also uh, Moritz Lehmann uh, that raised the hands. I, didn't, I don't see him. Ah, Mas, okay, yeah, yes. Let me see. Ah, okay, now, now I can speak. So um, my, my question is, um, the, the sponge on, on the seafloor, is it expected to um, be rather lonely on the seafloor or is there always um, other sponges or um, important surface features nearby that would influence the, um, the nearby flow pattern? This is a very good question, thank you very much. Uh, well, actually it is not really known. It is very complicated to uh, have in vivo um, information on this sponge because they are quite uh, re um, rare and they are um, uh, found usually dead in the nets of the fishermen. Okay, so there are some um, uh, images that show these sponges uh, alone, completely alone in the seabed or with other sponges on the, uh, around them, okay? Like, uh, um, uh, uh, like flowers, okay? So uh, both of the configurations are known to be real, real, okay? We do not know how many of them can group 
uh, the distance between them, if there is an average distance or there is a, a medium distance, if there is a maximum distance, we do not know them. They, it's like if they were um, aliens from another world. It's very complicated to study uh, these. And we resorted to the papers at the end of the 19th century because on the living Euplectel aspergillum, there is almost nothing in the scientific literature, also from a biology point of view. So it, it's not easy to, under, to answer your question, which is a very good question. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Of course, we did all this work because we feel that all the properties of this uh, sponge can be exported for uh, uh, engineering structures like skyscrapers, uh, nautical structures, aerodynamic structures, so on and so forth. We, so we are uh, uh, still um, uh, processing the huge amount of data that we collected. But the plan is to extrapolate the performance of this beautiful organism to make new engineering structures. Okay, the shrimp. Uh, this is a very good question. Um, well, I, I don't know if they can influence, of course they influence the, the flow, but I think that they benefit from the um, swirling motion inside because the shrimp can live just for feeding as well as the sponge. And uh, the symbiosis actually is not mm, very well defined also from a biology point of view. So the, the, the biologists say if they live inside, there must be a reason, so they, they must be in symbiosis. For instance, maybe they can, the shrimp can eat on some parasites that can uh, attack this, the, the, um, uh, the, the living sponge. But uh, what is the clear effect of the presence of the uh, shrimp, which is not always, they are not always present. They are uh, usually present, but not always inside the sponge. And so it is not clear uh, their role completely. Uh, of course, they influence the flow, but uh, the reason for uh, their presence uh, must be a biological one, not a food dynamic one. Thank you very much. You're very kind, Mark. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, if there are no further questions, uh, I would again um, thank very much the um, Giacomo for the very beautiful presentation. And I will thank, thank you, you for coming along. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, so um, this session is closed today and uh, there is the technical session nine this afternoon at 3 p.m. Um, so, uh, have a good day and uh, see you later then or in case tomorrow, tomorrow morning for the plenary talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very, very much. much. Bye.